I think architecture is really a super business. We have possibilities to do things that are unimaginable. Uh, Bonjour. Today I have the honor of conversing with Edouard Francois, the distinguished successor of Edouard Francois Lamazon. Edouard Uh, embodies the roles of a designer, architect and urban planner, having refined his craft at institutions such as l'École Nationale des Beaux-Arts and l'École Nationale des Pontes et Chassis. Moreover, he has bestowed his knowledge upon students and the esteemed national landscaping schools of Versailles and Grasse. In recognition of his profound contribution to the field of architecture, he was bestowed with the title of Designer of the Year in 2011 and further honoured as an international fellow by the RBA. By 2019, his influence and innovation had catapulted him into the top 100 architects globally as per the rankings of Domus magazine. So Edward is celebrated for his dynamic and spirited approach to life and work. He is profoundly influenced by authenticity, permeating through aspects of gastronomy, interpersonal relationships and of course his architectural endeavours. Through his illustrious career Edward has graced the lecterns of globally recognised institutions such as the AA in London, the ESA in Paris the Design Academy of Eindhoven, where he has been sharing his wisdom and insights. The global community continues to laud the uniqueness and exemplary quality of his work. His creations have found permanent home in prestigious establishments such as the Centre Pompidou, the Canadian Centre for Architecture, the, N- the New York Guggenheim and the V&A in London, cementing his legacy as a luminary in the architectural domain. So this was an absolutely fantastic conversation. Edward was truly inspiring and we go into a lot of depth really the kind of three phases of his career where first of all he started off as a very young architect working on big scale projects Um, not the kind of work that perhaps you'd know know him for now but that's where he really kind of you know cut his teeth as it were he learned his craft he knew how to put buildings together he knew how to work with complex demanding clients and There was a whole world of just kind of really learning the craft of of architecture and leading large scale projects from an early age. Then we move on to talking about the second phase, which was a lot more risky in its approach, but kind of intellectually and more where Edouard's heart was, which is where he started to explore much deeper kind of conceptual and theoretical ideas that perhaps meant that the money-making side of architecture was postponed for a bit in order for him to develop this kind of language and ideas of where he wanted to go. And that was quite a long phase in his career, but he was incredibly masterful with being able to take ideas and market them and publicize them and his own kind of personal brand and personality and his ability to communicate really demonstrated how he was kind of creating a uh, a seductive world, if you like, where people wanted to know who he was. He was gaining a reputation in France um, and becoming a, a very prominent uh, personality as a thought leader and as a creative force. And the third phase was actually then starting to take these concepts and start making real money from them and actually turning them into real built projects. So we talk a lot about you know his approach to charging a lot of money and the very direct conversations he will have with clients, how he's not afraid to say no, how he doesn't do dog and pony shows of showing clients loads and loads of portfolios and work, but rather is actually very unique in his communication style and the way that he'll engage and tease information out of a client. And I, I think one of the other things that you'll better take away from this conversation is a lot of kind of insights and secrets to actually developing and creating a powerful personal brand. So this is a, a fantastic interview, a real privilege for me to speak with uh, um, you know one of the one of the world's greats, if you like, and and just lovely to sit down and speak with um, Edouard in his Parisian studio. So sit back, enjoy Edouard Francois. Special announcement to all you Business of Architecture UK listeners. Once again, thank you so much for your continued support and listening over the last six years since we started in 2018. 
As I said last time in the last episode, we are merging with our sister channel, Business of Architecture. So please make sure that you go and follow and subscribe on YouTube, on Apple iTunes, on Spotify, wherever it is that you're listening to this podcast. Make sure that you go and listen to the Business of Architecture one there. As Business of Architecture UK, we will be merging our podcasts into that format. We're not disappearing, we're not going anywhere. Um, we, we are just merging the two channels together, which means that this episode is the final episode for Business of Architecture UK. Oh, It's been a wild journey. It's been fantastic fun. But we look forward to continue bringing you all of the best news, information, profit-making tips, strategies, and ideas from the world's leading architectural practices and from our own smart practice consulting practice methods. So I look forward to seeing you and hearing you over on the Business of Architecture main channel where the two are now merging. Don't forget, go over there and subscribe. And once again, thank you so much. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Edouard, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Fine and you, Ryan? I'm very good, thank you. An absolute honor to have you on the on the show. You are the, the principal of Maison Edouard Poinsois. Um, you've got an incredible portfolio of work. There's you know some really extraordinary projects internationally, in in France, in Paris, housing, civic projects, um, cultural projects, a real diverse portfolio. Um, you're one of the kind of leading practices in France at the moment. Uh, I know that you guys were voted in the top 100 architecture practices in in Domus uh, a few years back. You're an international um, uh, fellow of the ROBA, of course. You've lectured internationally. You've lectured here in, in the UK as well as in France and, uh, and other, other places. And you've really built you know, quite a, an extraordinary international reputation uh, as a as a practice, so absolutely amazing to to have you here and to be discussing a little bit about this. So I guess my first question is, how did the practice start? Um, it's a curiosity, I think, because uh, uh, in France there's a, a guy who is saying, if you don't have the reference, you won't have the job, yeah. uh, and if you don't have the job, you don't have reference. So it's a circle. <laughs> And yeah. At a certain moment, you have to cut it. So, so I think I did very little things. I did uh, a little things for my mother's uh, room. Uh, after that, uh, I did uh, two room. After that, I did uh, a kitchen. <laughs> it was very, 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 very slow. But at a certain moment. Um, uh, I had clients and it was extremely, extremely complex uh, to, uh, to do things because the client, he knows the money, etc. And, uh, and so at a certain moment, I decided to be totally autist. So mm-hmm. I said, I just focus on what I want. The client, I don't care. And uh, if, I, uh, if I go away, bloom, uh, it's, it's okay for me. And so that's how I begin. So, so that's that's a lot of architects struggle to be able to do that without like upsetting the clients or losing work. How 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 do you create that relationship with the client so that they so that they trust you to do what you say is the the, the right thing, if you like? I think uh, w- w- what I'm telling to my student is. The problematic that are very interesting in architecture, you keep that for you. It's not the problematic for the client. For the client, you speak only the money, how it's built, how economic it is, how well it's, it's working, how the parking is a super parking, etc. But you don't speak about your facade. And when I did the facade of the Fouquet's, I was explaining to the client or administrative, uh, administrative authorization, 
Yeah. And so I said, look, the parking is super here. Uh, you have the basement. And, uh, and my assistant says, uh, Edward, you don't speak about the facade. So <laughs> <laughs> you never have to speak about the facade. The facade is there so we can see the facade. <laughs> <laughs> but that's 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 so interesting. It reminds me of the the kind of Mies van der Rohe quote, where he said, "No, never talk to your client about architecture. Ask them how how exactly. how his dog is." Exactly. Ask them yeah. And they they so, don't they don't like factory when you speak architecture because factory it's a drama because we are doing new things that doesn't exist. So. Is it working? Is it possible to sell it? How will it cost? Because when you are dealing with new material, new materiality, new assemblage, uh, combination, uh, mm -hmm. it's not so intuitive how much it will cost. If you're dealing with uh, totally common things, it's obvious for everybody it costs this amount that is the amount, the banal amount. Yeah. So don't speak architecture. So the first, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and how about winning work? So you you went from doing kind of little pieces of of kitchen and like residential yeah. stuff, like now the kind of work that you're doing is you know it's the it's the envy of many practices to have that kind of international. Yeah, actually, have uh, very very big operations. We are doing a big project, for example, in Bordeaux, that is 80,000 meters square. And it's factory, it's a piece of urbanist, but in another hand, it's we are the only architect of that. So it's a piece of uh, architecture also. And we are in an area that is a, a UNESCO area. Wow. And so we're alone and it's very big. Amazing. And, and, and so that, that kind of moving from, you know, when did you start the practice? When I was 24, very young. Wow. Uh, very young. Curiously, I was in an engineer school, and my teacher uh, says to me, uh, yes, we have a problem with a developer. Uh, can you help me? So I was looking to his uh, thing, and, and I said, uh, we could do that and that and that and that and that. So he said that to the developer, and the developer says, uh, uh, can you send me the guy, your student? <laughs> <laughs> and it was a piece of, a, it was a huge development that was um, 1,000, uh, no, 102,000 meters square. Right. Wow. So, square. So it's a pretty big stuff. And I, I wasn't architect at this moment. Mm -hmm. And so the guy, uh, this developer, they are really playing uh, with the money. He said, uh, Edouard is uh, the, the student of the guy who is controlling the area. I take the student, that's okay. And uh, he said to me, you're my architect. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't architect, I think I was uh, 24 years old. And uh, so he trains me after that. You're a super body. You had, you, you, you'd, you'd won your experience, you'd built the muscle. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant, and it, so that's that's very young to kind of go out on your own. Did you at any point work for somebody else or work in another practice? Little things, but you know, in in a hand, uh, I was twenty four, and um, uh, when I was doing my practice, I didn't want a teacher to to take my head. So I had a lot of different teachers. So at the end. I had it, uh, I was uh, teached in an incoherent way because mm -hmm. this, this this teacher says that the other say that this one say that at yeah. the end you don't know and so I had this very huge uh, uh, development and so I wasn't uh, strong enough to I didn't know what I want so okay I'm clever so I <laughs> I made a joke but, but the project <laughs> was not good so it wasn't a good project. Uh, it takes a certain time to know what do you want to do. Yeah. What do you want to do? What is your issue? What is interesting mm -hmm. for you? Uh, so this is a second hand. So my career was made made on uh, three areas. First areas I have uh, first the beginning I had a lot and a lot of projects, but I was totally lost. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and uh, I have project very big, Marina, urban uh, development in the city of Paris, etc., uh, etc. Et yeah. And I, I had I, I had partners, and uh, arriving to a certain moment, I said, uh, "No, I, I, it's not me." It's mm -hmm. too difficult. I don't know how to speak with a developer. It's too complex. So mm -hmm. I am, I'm going to stop. I don't want to build. I built when I was 27. Mm -hmm. I built, I built something like 100, a thousand meters square. Right. So it's very, very big. So when you do that, you know everything about the details, etc. And so my, the second part of my life was I want to know what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And so I did a competition, but I didn't want to win the competition. I just want to do a super project. Building, I was building before. So I want to build something very good, but not building for building. And so I began to be very well known. And so media, media, etc., television. Uh, uh, but I didn't build. But in my head, I was saying, at the end, you have to connect yeah. <laughs> good ideas and building. It, and it was the third part of my uh, life. And so I rebuilt very, very interesting things, but very, very small. I, I did a, a building in Jupy. Uh, it is, it is a, a gîte, a mot de gîte, a small housing for holidays. Yeah. It's very small. I did, uh, uh, I think, six units. Mm -hmm. So it's very small, but very beautiful. They are in they are in the greeneries in in front of the forest, and so I was very happy to do that. And curiously, it multiplies by two, by two, by two, by two, by two. And now I'm doing very very big commission. Curiously, as big <laughs> as before, <laughs> but now it's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's 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 an amazing um, career progression. So, so, the early days of your career, you were doing big stuff, but it yeah, wasn't. You build, you wasn't, build, and you build. But it wasn't the way. It wasn't your kind of artistic mark on it as such. Yeah. And then you went into the world of kind of doing competitions and more theoretical, and 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 having ideas that were being publicly spoken about, and and that would have meant, I'm guessing, then that you would have stopped doing some of that big development work in order to be able to kind of focus on ideas. And then eventually, then you started to actually make these ideas come real, but it was on a small scale to begin with. Yeah. And then that grew. So yeah. that, that's very, you know, so many practices would love to kind of do that. But that, you know, turning away some of those bigger projects when there was probably, you know, good fees coming in or money, and then moving into kind of more theoretical competition work. How did you balance that with the need to be making money or supporting a team or did you kind of did you kind of shrink down your team and kind of go solo how did that work i had the chance not to be so interested uh, with money so i was in a, in the limit of a bank route <laughs> <laughs> during uh, probably 10 years so i it wasn't so happy but in a way i was happy because uh, i was doing what i wanted to do mm -hmm. You have to adapt yourself in terms of uh, consumption of the money you have. So it's not so difficult. Got it. Got it. So it was kind of, you yeah. had to reduce your expenses down and... In a way, the money I have was the media. It is right. the money. Right. Because you are, you are well known. Mm -hmm. you, everybody's speaking about your work. You're somebody, you're not a shit, totally lost <laughs> in the architecture market. You exist, okay, you don't have money, but uh, I, I think I will probably one day, I will arrive to make money, but it's not, uh, it wasn't my uh, obsession at this moment. Yes, yeah. So, it, so you were kind of, you were building your reputation yeah. and, and your visibility if you like, as, as an architect. Yeah. Um, but I had some, I had a moment very difficult. At the end of the second part, I had media you cannot imagine, television, etc. Yeah. It, it was crazy. Uh, and uh, I didn't have no commission. 
no commission. So everybody was speaking about me, what I'm doing. Uh, and one day I was in front of a, um, a very big shop. It's Habitat, you know, Habitat shop for uh, furniture of house. Yeah. Yep. And I saw a little uh, chair uh, in the in the window, in the frame. I said, wow, it's super beautiful object. Uh, how oh, it's so simple, so nice, so so perfect. So I enter in the shop and I said, uh, I'm interested in this little object. I find it very, very beautiful. I hope you still have one. And the guy looked to me and said, you're the first guy who is asking me to buy that. <laughs> and it was in the front. Right. And so I said, this chair is you. Mm -hmm. You are in the front. Everybody's speaking about you, but nobody is buying you. Yes. <laughs> and I had a panic. <laughs> I said, probably I, said, I am in a bad uh, direction. Yeah. So, so, so how, did, how did you make that kind of, how did you start to capitalize on the, on the, on the fame, if you like, and the, and the kind of publicity that you had, and then to actually start winning commissions? It's, uh, I think uh, I did some very small project. Mm -hmm. I, I call that specific project. It's, for example, an uh, installation, sort of art installation in the Festival of Chaumont. So it's very beautiful, but it's not architecture, but it's very beautiful. It's a small scale, but uh, it's okay. And I did things like that, but it's too specific, so... Everybody was saying Edouard is a very good architect, very mm -hmm. good designer. But if a client look look to that, and if you ask the client, is Edouard is, is Edouard uh, has the possibility to design a, 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 a housing project? No, no, it's difficult to pass to this little thing to a housing. Yes. And yeah. I was wondering about that and I said, I need to do a, a generic project. And the first project I did was a generic was Montpellier, you know, with the, the balconies. Yes. And it, it was a, a builder. He was in uh, with his wife at, at his private swimming pool and mm -hmm. he was looking at a magazine. <laughs> the magazine was uh, Madame Figaro. Right. So Madame Figaro is very chic, very bourgeois, and they, they, they had, I had an interview with Madame Figaro, and uh, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> it was horrible, this interview. They, <laughs> they, they, they said, first, we're going to take the portrait of you. And I said, me? No, 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 put my project. No, no, it's a stupid to have my, my, <laughs> my portrait. I said, no, 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 your project is not interesting, but uh, uh, our client or the guy who's reading our magazine, they like the personality. And so I was like that. <laughs> all, all black. <laughs> full page. Yes, all black in full page. And the text was, Edouard is, is transformat transformated, ugliness in beautiness, et cetera, et cetera. When I received this magazine, I said, oh my God, it's totally stupid. It's a very good <laughs> magazine. <laughs> but with, with that, I will have nothing. And this guy, he was looking to that, my portrait. Said, mm -hmm. oh, nice guy. And uh, he's transforming ugliness and beautiness. Oh, the super. <laughs> and he phoned me. Amazing. And he said, Edouard, uh, I am a builder in Montpellier. Uh, I'd like to work with you. Uh, you are very interesting. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, interesting of what? Uh, I love your project. <laughs> How can you love my project? Nothing is described. You don't have any photo. I said, yeah, I like it very much. I will give you a project. So this was my first generic project. Amazing. It must have been a very good, a very good portrait photo of you then. Yeah, and, and I said to everybody, uh, don't show your project. Mm. And for example, when a client is interesting by your thoughts, don't show your project. It's not necessary. Your projects are reducing your problematic. And if a client likes one project, the, the worst thing he could ask is make a copy. So you don't mm -hmm. want to make a copy of your project. Yeah. 
So, that, the, the, so this is very interesting kind of way of, um, let's say, kind of a, a, a strategy with the media, if you yeah. like, where you're kind of actually, most architects want to show loads of images of everything and it's kind of cheapening, if you like, the product. Yeah. Whereas here you're talking about keeping it more elusive or secretive. It's very... Um, I mean, it's quite akin, you know, we were talking about Hermé, you know, your your T-shirt, um, the way that they market, if you like, it's very exclusive. And The, the T-shirt is another thing, just to finish to this reference project, when you enter in my office, you don't have any project. Hmm. We don't show our project. I don't like that. We have a portrait of Louis XIV. <laughs> we have uh, candles, very big candles in uh, silver uh, that are exceptional. Uh, we have masterpiece of art, but we don't show what we are doing. I don't like that because uh, it is a universe that we have to share with the client, but not our reference. Our reference are dead. It's finished. Mm -hmm. It's in a box, uh, uh, and we want to do other things, so we don't show. Amazing. So, so uh, today, what what is your kind of strategy like with the media? Do you still do the same sort of thing where you kind of perhaps you hold back on projects getting published and have more other things? So when I did uh, the Cheval Blanc in Paris, mm -hmm. the hotel that is classified actually the best hotel worldwide. It's yeah. for uh, LVMH, uh, Mr. Bernard Arnault. Uh, they asked me to be in, um, how do you call that, uh, a confidentiality. So you, uh, because it's an hotel, nobody has to know what kind of development we do, what are our position to the suite, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a development totally confidential. Yeah. And uh, the spot of confidentiality, uh, you cannot show to the media nothing. But when I win this competition, a very big media um, come and said, we, we want to do an article uh, about your Cheval Blanc project and you. And I said, that's okay, we could do that. But we are, you could just take a photo of me in front of the existing building. I will show you nothing. <laughs> and you do show my part. That's all. And so at this moment, I decided to stop uh, totally communication with the media. So yeah. I did a sort of diet, a sort of diet, 10 years diet. So you, you, and it was really nice. Amazing. It was, yeah, really nice to have no media during 10 years. Mm -hmm. Amazing, and, and so, so if you're working with clients like 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 that, um, do they do they recommend you a lot? How do you kind of how do you prospect and win new projects? Uh, prospection is another thing. Uh, how do we prospect? Uh, it's very curious. We are like a little uh, nuts in the river, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, I never did an hotel. Actually, we do the best hotel. It's a curiosity. Uh, we are doing commercial areas, very big. It's one guy, he was interested, and so he ordered, he gave this commission to, to, to us. We go where the wind goes in a certain <laughs> way. Got it. And, and this is nice in a way because the worst thing you can do is doing always the same program mm -hmm. and you're and... going to be bad doing that and uh, for example when i did my first hotel it was the fouquet's barrier on the champs Elysees, very luxury mm -hmm. and i said to myself i need at the same moment to develop social housing in the office luxury with a with the ephemeral, no, with the superficial, blah, 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 and housing, very poor, few money, and so yeah. it's interesting. So I take things from the luxury to put in how the, the social housing and social housing uh, in luxury. And when I did Cheval Blanc, I said Cheval Blanc is one of the most important operation of uh, 
luxury hotel. I have to do a, a tower in Paris uh, of social housing, and I did this tower of social housing in Titanium mm -hmm. in Paris. So it's the way to be uh, to, to to be free uh, in terms of uh, thoughts, uh, to have not this influence uh, of the, the, the commission. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that again, that's really quite something to be able to be working on these very luxurious hotels and glamorous projects, and then working on you know working on social affordable housing projects, and the two are such different different worlds. Yeah, but it's nice. So, uh, for example, we are doing design furniture. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of lot of furniture. We don't commercial commercial commercialize them. Yeah. Uh, probably there will be a moment we are going to commercialize them. We have a lot of chairs, uh, bands, tables, uh, lights, uh, and for us uh, handles. And for me, it's important because it's um, it's more near the humanity. You know, a handle. You're in the contact with the hand. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's a problematic difference when you do this big operation of urbanism. Where's the human in that? You don't yeah. know. You're you're being to be a a serial killer. You know. <laughs> no, no towers. <laughs> so so when when clients are engaging with you, and again, it's you know it's so interesting that you've got you've got clients in that kind of luxury world and you've got clients in the, in the affordable housing space. What are they, what are they coming for? Like what, what is it that they, they, they want when they come to you? Like what, what's the attraction? I think, yeah. I think now they are interested in um, having a vision. Mm -hmm. the, the vision for it, for them, it's the word they say, Edouard, you have a vision and we're interested in that. By the time when you see my portfolio, you could look at the project I did 25 years ago. They are still in actuality. They are dealing about materiality. They are dealing about ornamentation. They are dealing about use. They are dealing about landscape. They are dealing about nature 25 years ago. So when they know that, they said, this guy is, is, um, is, il est juste, is right. The vision is right. So, so that's why they're interested. And they're interested intellectually for that, but mm -hmm. they're interested also for their team. They have teams, so for their team, it's a sort of a regenerescence of uh, ideas, position, of, uh, and it's interesting for them in terms of reference, to have a good reference in, in terms of architecture, because now, um, when you want to do something in a city, mm -hmm. you need to have good reference because the town mayor said, you're too bad builder, so we don't want to work with you. Yeah. How, how do you balance kind of the creativity and the vision for a project with something like the fees of the project or the, f the budget for the construction? Like, how does, that, how does the money side and the creative side, how do they coexist? <laughs> and there's something very, very interesting uh, that is arriving actually is uh, frugality. It's a French word, but that's it. For, for, we have it in English too. Yeah. Frugal. Frugal. Yeah. Uh, we, frugal is very important. And so frugal means try to do something with very few things. And so I don't care about the budget because we're in society that is so. Um, uh, artificial that mm -hmm. they need money for doing this all this artificiality of mm -hmm. beauty and, blah, 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 blah. and mm -hmm. so if you don't need that the, the problem of budget doesn't exist I mm -hmm. never have economic problems mm -hmm. so so even on the have. on the kind of luxury projects there isn't like yeah. an indulgence if you like with the spend in the luxury project, they never speak about money. They don't care. They want to see the the strong, the strongest of the ideas. Mm -hmm. But for Bernard, I know I didn't want to do stupidities that cost a lot of money. We have. Sure. I try to be strict in terms of what is efficient. This mm -hmm. is efficient. This is not efficient, and I'm limiting myself to that. Yeah. 
and then obviously with the with the affordable housing the budgets are much more constrained and the problematic is also you can resolve them with the the vision the the, the rightness of the vision for example I did this tower uh, in Paris in Titanium. It was social housing, and the town mm -hmm. mayor tells me, it, "Well, you're crazy doing a social housing building with a facade in Titanium. <laughs> <laughs> it is not possible." Uh, and I said, uh, uh, "I said I understand what you're saying, Mr. Town Mayor, uh, but um, it is not a facade in Titanium." Mm -hmm. It is a temporary storage of a material that is going to return, if we have problem with China, to the French industry of, uh, <laughs> of planes for Marcel Dassault to do the reactors, <laughs> for, the, <laughs> for the hospital to do the bones uh, in the titanium. And so it will so be it's at a, the it's, end. A, it's a store, it's a vault. <laughs> Yeah, it will be at the end a sort of dirty facade with an enduit painting uh, that you like. Yeah. And he said, uh, it's not so stupid, this temporary thing. Mm -hmm. And I said that if this arrives, I will say, okay, I think it's interesting to deal with that. These problematics are there. Well, it was 10 years ago now, we are totally in this problematics, but 10 years before, there was a little smell of the, that idea. Now, wow. it's it's not a smell, it's a hat. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. It's ultra, okay. ultra present. <laughs> so, so in terms of your fees, then, how do you how do you negotiate your fees and make sure that you, you're getting paid the right amount of money so that you can support the office and the team? And has that has that been something that come, has come easily or that you've learned over time how to get good at that? Or I think the architect kills architecture. They don't um, have the... Um, they don't... Uh, ose, how do you call ose, they, um, they limit themselves, themselves in terms of idea because they right. say, Wow, it's too difficult. I cannot do that uh, because I'm just an architect. I'm not a guy who's going to take, it's, give visions. I just have to answer to the client. So they limit themselves. And in terms of fees, it is the same problematic. They mm -hmm. said, if I give fees that is too high, that are too high, I won't have the commission. So I limit myself. No, we give a commission that ultra high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's ultra high. And the, the guy said, well, Edward, you, you realize this? It's a really very important person. That's okay. It's not a problem for you. You, wow, with my project, you will have a lot of money in your pocket. So, uh, so it's going to be good for you. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, we still be like that. And so we don't change uh, the mm -hmm. problematic of money. And we said, uh, if you want to take another architect that is uh, a more economic, it's not a problem. It's a, it's a choice for you. Got it. Got it. So, you, so you've always kind of known to put your fees high and that, yeah. and, and that, and that actually the fees... You know, you need to have the high fees to be able yeah. to get the vision that the client is asking for. And also, I, I'm not hurried uh, to sign a contract. Mm -hmm. For it could take one year, one year and a half. I don't care. Mm -hmm. At the end, after one year and a half, you don't have a contract, but you have the administrative authorization. What can the client do? Yeah. You have all the rights. Yeah. What can you do? And I said to my client, as long as you wait to sign the contract, I how, uh, uh, how high my honorary, my fees will be. Right. And he said, please, Edouard, we need to sign now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the longer the wait, the fees are going up. <laughs> yeah. And in a way, they are totally blocked. What can yes. they do? They have pay for the development, they don't mm -hmm. have contract, 
So they don't have the rules. The rules mm -hmm. is the rules I, I, I am going to to impose. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in in terms of so that's I mean, again that's very very interesting and and kind of quite quite clever really, in terms of being able to negotiate like that and really knowing your worth and you know and not backing down on your fees because again so many architects will will they'll just they'll just lower their fees. As soon as the client pushes back, they lower the fees. And what you're saying is that you're quite happy to walk away from a project. Yeah, and um, uh, it's not a problem, this problem of fees. Mm -hmm. For example, I could accept to work for a very, very small amount, mm -hmm. but it's going to be inside the problematic. Right. So it's got to be like interesting projects. Yeah. So I said, for example, when you work uh, in in, uh, in, in foreigners' uh, area, cities, mm -hmm. uh, countries, uh, for example, you, you are obliged to repeat. Right. You you cannot do sur mesure. Uh, so you have one or two rooms, you repeat the rooms and you repeat the blocks. Uh, so it's included in the problematic of the fees. You don't yeah. have the, the amount of fees and the time that uh, you have, for example, in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so you adapt your conception, yeah. your thought to the problematic of the fees. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, so when is a client not a fit for you? Not, not, uh, not a fit. So when is when is the when is it not the right client? How do you how do you turn a client away or know that they're going to be a problem? Or when do you say no? Uh, I say no to stupidity, to brutality, uh, <laughs> to unhuman problematics. Uh, it arises me, for example, a client. He said. Yeah, Put a maximum of meta square, et toi, maximum, maximum. I said, okay, guy, yeah. shit. It's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. It has no sense. You won't be able to sell it. Uh, I don't want to do that. So mm -hmm. Take another guy, please, and let me do my job. Yeah. Yeah. And you have some guys, they, they, some developer, they're only focused on. Uh, Meta squares, meta square, meta square, simplicity. Uh... Mm -hmm. Amazing. It, it, the, the other thing that's very interesting about your work, you know, again, it, it's so, uh, the work itself is so interesting. Every project is so unique. It's really innovative. And you're working in a place like in, you know, in Paris, in France, which I imagine is similar to England and the UK in the sense yes. that there's, there's a lot of restrictions and it can be very conservative in terms of you're working with historic buildings and you're working right next door to, you know, medieval streets and cathedrals and to all of this kind of thing. And yet some of your, your propositions are, are they're, they're really innovative. They're very new. How do you, how do you manage to get some of these things built? Like, do, do you, do you get problems with, um, you know, cause I know Paris is a very difficult place to, or not. I'm doing things in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> very, very crazy. Very, uh, you have to know that, um, since I was 24, I quite only work with private builders. Mm -hmm. So to work with private builders, <laughs> yeah. you have some architects, they only know, they only work with the public. So they mm -hmm. have very little teeth, no, <laughs> no male, <laughs> no muscles. <laughs> and so when you are in front of this problematic, uh, they cannot arrive. Right. But I can really leave uh, uh, in a forest, in a forest with a dinosaur, the I will find food. I will find an animal. <laughs> <laughs> so all this problematic of uh, regulation, of uh, uh, historical monument, etc. Mm -hmm. I don't care. For example, the project I have in uh, in Bordeaux, it was with Alain Juppé. 
we are in a, a, a patrimoine mondial uh, UNESCO, UNESCO patrimoine worldwide, is that? Right. Uh, yep. So it's difficult. So I did a project that is very obvious, and uh, uh, so it, the project is eighty thousand meters square. And uh, Alain Juppé uh, said, said to me, "But how could we we how we will do?" With how could we do your project uh, with our PLU, our regulation, your plan? I said, uh, Mr. the First Minister, uh, I understand your question, but your uh, urban regulation is only taking care about the Velux on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> it seems that I don't propose you to do a Velux. I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, yes, but you don't answer to my question. Uh, Mr. The Prime Minister, um, I will answer to you. We're going to take all the articles of your regulation and we will put uh, uh, and he said, he, he said to me, uh, I understand the idea. It is not exactly the same sentence that we're going to put, <laughs> but we will arrive to the same result. <laughs> This is this is a very rock and roll approach to planning. <laughs> and so uh, it's a way to challenge the situation. If you want to say a first article, yes, but uh, we are not so... It's better. <laughs> and to do that, to return to the T-shirt, you yeah. need to have a special look. Mm-hmm. You mustn't have the same look that the other guys. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you have the same look that the other guys, you have the same problematic, same answers. Mm -hmm. So you have you need to have a totally different look. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really the kind of like they're buying into the brand. Of, it's like of the you. monk. It's like the monk. <laughs> Labi <laughs> is making the monk. <laughs> <laughs> It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, and tell me a little bit about how the business has grown in terms of people. Um, obviously, when you first started, it was it was you were you know as a young man, twenty four. It was I'm imagining it was just you by yourself and perhaps a few. No, I had uh, I had twenty five uh, thirty persons when I was young. Got it. Uh, I, I, um, we are always uh, 30, 40 uh, persons. With the COVID, we go to 10 persons, but now yep. we return. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have 100, 100 of persons mm -hmm. because with the problematic that we have with 40 persons, it's really very, very much of energy for me to 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 inform, to feed all the project. Got it. It's really too much. If I had more project, I think the quality it is not possible to have the same quality and it's too much persons. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you so, found that that kind of 30, 40 person firm is the yeah, ideal. Size. And, and how do you structure the teams inside? Do you have kind of teams that are just working on different projects or do you have kind of, here's the housing team, here's the luxury hospitality team, or there's a real yeah. mix of experience? It's totally mixed. Uh, it's important to mix to change the the teams. Got it. So it, so in 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 terms of the how the teams are structured, the project people are people are being mixed around quite a lot. So not having too much persons, not too much uh, problematics. Actually, you have to know that um, uh, the problematics are taking a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So a team is working on different projects. You know, it's a dot line mm -hmm. because activity, not activity, activity, not activity. And right. so one team could do uh, uh, different projects. Right. So that so when they when one project starts to not be so busy, then they can flip over. Yeah, the team is project. changing to another project or to another project. And in a way, it's nice and... Uh, the more you have time, the more you have the distance to appreciate it, what is uh, très, very precise or not precise. So 
all my work is to extract what is not directly necessary mm -hmm. to make purification of ideas. And mm -hmm. so when you purify the ideas, you, you make the price better also because you don't have any parasite. Uh, Got it. Nothing kind of eating away. At yeah. That. So it's uh, something that is important for me is not to hurry the client. I never hurry a client. The more we take time, the best it is. Right. Got it. So, and for example, for in the project of Montpellier, when this guy that was, was looking my beautiful portrait in Madame Figaro, <laughs> um, he was a builder, you know, this guy, he can kill me. Uh, yeah. And I, I tell him uh, that uh, we have to take time to know each other because I said, uh, I'm young, uh, you are very strong, you have to respect me, I have to understand your deals to make it very precise and if we take time, we will do a good thing. I propose you not to work uh, uh, before six months and we will have a one lunch every week. And so we will have an exchange. I will need to know what is the base of your work, what is nice, what what is the product that you sell very well, what is the product that you don't sell, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And so I will design for you a shoe that is sur mesure. So, <laughs> and it's what we do. We take six months. And the guy, he was quite fascinated by that. He said, he don't need money, this guy is not so, he don't take care, he just want to know me. Uh, yeah, appreciate. Mm -hmm. The time is the best friend for architecture. Right. And we go, we do sometimes too much fast sex. <laughs> it's too quick. <laughs> you don't have a... Any erotism, uh, any sensuality, it's only any fuck, so. play. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, uh, tell me a little bit about how you find working in other countries. They call me. They call you, and and yeah. and is it is it difficult? Is there a big kind of cultural learning? Do you have to collaborate with like local architects or? How does it work? I think, yeah, we always work with local architects because you have rules different and, and uh, the client, okay, they, they're they happy to have a, 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 an architect that has vision totally different, mm -hmm. but they need to have somebody who's going to be there to develop and to translate. Uh, so this is the way we do. Right, right, got it. And and in, in terms of say, for example, I know you're working in Qatar, or you you have been working in Qatar. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, there's kind of business cultural differences that you need to navigate. Has that ever been? You know, what kind of challenges do you have when you're working in in a new country? So when you work in, for example, in foreign foreigners foreigners uh, countries. Uh, there is a distance, you're different. Mm -hmm. It's like the t-shirt. You don't need to take a t-shirt, you are different. You're a foreigner. So you could say everything you want, they will hear you. Got it, got it. If not, they won't call you. They mm -hmm. said, okay, we make a misfit, bye-bye. Uh, yeah. So it's, sometimes it's quite easy to work in foreigners' country. Uh, the, the town mayors, they are more involved to modify the regulation because it's a foreigner that is with other problematics that are interesting, that are, are going to teach us an other way to, to develop architecture. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Brilliant. I think that's the... Perfect place to conclude the conversation there, Edouard. I mean, that was absolutely amazing. So really, really fascinating to to speak with you and to get a little gl glimpse inside of your your practice and, and how you do business. So thank you. Yeah, it is a, a special business. <laughs> but um, just to make my conclusion, I think architecture is really a super business. We have possibilities to do mm -hmm. things that are unimaginable. Uh, 
-hmm. And so everybody's complaining about uh, the difficulties with developer. Bullshit, the developer, they are nice. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem I have is with the historical monuments art guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they are in a situation of a yes or no. Yeah. It's no. It's no. Yeah. You cannot do that. Oh, you can do that. And so this way, I don't like Brilliant. Fantastic. A lot of optimism there, Edouard. So really, really appreciate we, it. We have to give optimism in our uh, projects. Uh, mm -hmm. We are living in a uh, moment of the society that is very positive. We know uh, where we have, where we are going to go. We know what are the main issues of the problematic. We have problematic of climate, of fitness. Uh, we have problematic of ecology, of economy. We have to reintroduce materiality. We have to reintroduce use in architecture. We have to reintroduce uh, ornamentation. Wow, it's fantastic. It is really fantastic. It's mm -hmm. a very open-minded area. Yeah, absolutely. Just open your your eyes and your ears and participate it. And everybody is going to follow you, I think. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.